It's an interesting question that she asked. Uh, last night, Jean and I were at a uh, Eastwood reunion. They had, uh, well, we probably had 80 to 100 people there. Uh, just of all different classes. Some of them you hadn't seen in 40 years. But it's an interesting, when you look at it, how many of them, uh, you can tell talking with them, how many of them have followed the Lord, how many of them were not following the Lord, how many of them have left and have come back to the Lord. And, uh, so anyway, it's just kind of an interesting, was it, it's a good question she's asking, but the, the fields are, are very, very uh, in need of uh, workers out there. So that kind of takes us, uh, yesterday I had a little restaurant in Broken Arrow that I stopped by quite often on Saturday morning and uh, I've known the owner for 30 some years. And, and, uh, so anyway, I just kind of like to usually bring something to read and just sit and relax for about 15 minutes, kind of enjoy my Saturday morning. And the uh, table next to me has a lady and her son. She looked like she was in her early 60s and he was in his 30s. But it looked like he'd had a stroke where something was on one side where he really had walked with a cane, had difficulty eating and, and uh, swallowing and everything. It makes you wonder uh, what kind of difficulty has she been living with? What kind of difficulty is she going to live with the rest of her life? Because obviously he, she's going to have to take care of him with the rest of her life. And uh, you think about it, living victoriously in difficult times is not easy. And would you agree that we're living in difficult times? Both as believers, both as a nation. And I think it's uh, not going to get any easier. But what does the Bible say about living victoriously in difficult times? So I'd like this to look at it. We're going to start off in just the background. It'll be in uh, Acts chapter 15. I'll give you the background, and then we'll kind of look at it. We've looked at part of this before, so far as the background, so I'll just kind of give you a summary. But do you remember in Acts 15, uh, they just had the Jerusalem Council, and they had come up with what was going to be the verdict with the Gentiles and the Jews and uh, what, how they were going to uh, look at the things of the Old Testament. And so they're going to, uh, in end of chapter 15, they, Paul said to Barnabas, so let's go visit the churches that we went to on the first missionary journey. And then they also then want to uh, uh, tell them the verdict and encourage them. Of course, there's then uh, Barnabas wants to bring, uh, you know, John Mark with him, and Paul doesn't want to, so they split, so they have a disagreement. And so then Paul then selects Silas, which starts off in chapter 16. In the first five verses of chapter 16, they're going through the different churches and they're giving the decree, they're encouraging the people. And they're also then, it says in the end of verse 5, that they're greatly increasing in number. So everything's going well. Everything's going well. But it's interesting when you get to chapter 16, then you go... Uh, starting in 6, which we saw also a few weeks ago. You remember, they're going through Asia Minor, and then the Holy Spirit says, no, you can't go there. They try to go to another location, the Holy Spirit says, no. That ever happened to you? When you've got plans and God says no? Not now, or not at all. And how many of us try to break the door down anyway? So it's interesting, you had a detour. Then you have the, uh, in verse 6 down to verse 10, you remember you would often call the, the uh, call over to Macedonian call, which is Greece. So they weren't planning on going to Greece, but the Holy Spirit's plans were for them to go to Greece. So they then go to Greece, and they start off the very first city that they're there is at Philippi. And if you remember, you have the conversion of Lydia in verse 11 to 15, she was one of purple. It's interesting. Let's look at verse 14 just for a second, just a side note. A certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, which remember Thyatira is in Asia Minor, and it is noted for its dye industry, a seller of purple fabric, a worshiper of God, was listening, and notice the next part, and the Lord did what? Opened her heart. It's always a joint effort. In 1 Corinthians 2, when you speak to the things of the gospel, it is darkness to a non-believer unless the Holy Spirit opens their eyes. I think so often we have to realize it is a joint effort. We do our part, but the Holy Spirit has to open their eyes. So they come to know. She comes to know, and others do. 
And then there is a, a young lady who is uh, demon-possessed. And Paul casts out the demon, and the people who are her master basically were using her. And uh, obviously, and making money, and when the demon's gone, they can't do it. So they stir up the whole city. Paul and Silas get beaten with rods, which was the Roman punishment. The problem is, Paul and Silas are Roman citizens, and you're not allowed to do that without a trial. Uh, and they're in stocks, so they've been beaten with rods. And then you're put in stocks. How, hard, how would that feel? Just being in stocks would be bad, but after you've been beaten, it would be even worse. Notice in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were doing what? And and the prisoners are listening. You think about it. Switch places with Paul or Silas, and what would you be doing? Crying. Crying, demanding your rights, telling God it's not fair, I didn't sign up for this, whatever it might be. Notice that the prisoners were listening and there's a great earthquake and everyone's chains fall off. And then you'll notice the jailer, obviously if you know Roman law, if a prisoner gets free, you're killed because the prisoner got loose. So he was going to fall on his own sword because he'd rather go die that way than die the way that they would get put into death. It's interesting, Paul says don't uh, do that. Not one prisoner is left. You know, that's amazing to me. Because I don't care what jail you go to in Oklahoma or anywhere, if all the doors open and everything's free, to say that everyone's going to stay in their jail cell and not leave is slim and none if the God's not in it. What was said to them that in order for them to stay there, I don't know. But obviously, the Holy Spirit, but also I suspect Paul had said something to them through the Holy Spirit. They all stayed there. And then notice then what happens then. The Philippian jailer falls down at their feet. And what does he say? What must I do to be saved? If they had done what most of us would have done, would that have occurred? You think about it. Because the way they responded to the difficulty, the Philippian jailer recognizes they have something that I don't have. And he wants it. So that's the kind of the background you look at. Obviously they come to know Christ, uh, and he and his family, and they then are basically run out of the city. So in chapter 17, you go from that city, and you go then to Thessalonica, and you're there and you're reasoning for just a short period of time, and you notice in verse 5, the, je- the Jews become jealous, and they stir up the whole crowd, and they're staying at Jason's home, and they then basically put make Jason put up a, a large sum of money, saying if any more things happen, we take your money from you. So they leave that city. And you'll notice then they go to Berea. And when they get to Berea, you'll notice you find the same thing happens when they're at Berea the Jews come down and stir up the crowd again. Everywhere you're going, what's happening? You're serving the Lord. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And there's opposition every time. How many of you might be getting a little tired of this? And what would most of us do? You think about it today. You speak up for what Christ says and what the Scripture says. You will have opposition. And you'll have it every day. You think about this in the background then. So everywhere they go, they have problems. And you'll also just, for curiosity, or not for curiosity, but just for information, it's because they were not at, uh, at uh, Thessalonica very long, they were forced to leave. Uh, they were then young children in, in their faith. When they, go, when they notice, they then go to Athens. And while they're in Athens, if you know First Thessalonians, Paul writes First Thessalonians to them because as young children in the faith, he's concerned about it. They misinterpret 1 Thessalonians. He then has to write 2 Thessalonians shortly thereafter. So they're young Christians, 
The second problem they have is in verse 11 of chapter 17, the Thessalonians. He's speaking about the Bereans, but notice what he says. Now these were more noble-minded than those at Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see whether they're true or not. So when he was at Thessalonica, which is a short period of time, but did they really examine things that Paul was saying? So they don't know their Bible, and they're young believers. What happens to when somebody doesn't know their Bible and they're young believers and difficulties come? And that's what's going to happen. So you want to look at this, the background. So I'm going to think about three things then when it comes to difficulties. First of all, it's a fact of life. As a believer, it's a fact of life. It's going to happen. First of all, you think about it with Christ. Psalms 22, was he going to suffer? Isaiah 53, was he going to suffer? On Wednesday night, we saw already twice in Mark chapter 8, and verse 31, chapter 9, verse 12, chapter 9, verse 31, Christ keeps telling I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer at the hands of the scribes, the Pharisees. I'm going to be put to death. I'm going to raise again on the third day. Christ said it was going to be that way. I'll just read it for you. But in Acts chapter 9, if you remember, what about Paul? If you remember when he is blinded and he's uh, on his conversion, and you remember he was told the man was supposed to come and visit him? Let me just read this in chapter 9 of Acts, and then we'll get on. But Lord said to him, talking about the, go to him, he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear the name before the Gentiles and the kings and sons of Israel, for I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. He knew it, you know, before he ever came to know Christ, suffering was going to be part of it. And I think it's important for all of us to recognize suffering is going to be part of the Christian life. And so I think it's important to look at it. Look over then, since we're talking about Thessalonica, start in chapter 3 of uh, 1 Thessalonians. It's a fact for Christ. It's a fact for Paul. And since Paul was only at Thessalonica a very short period of time, we notice what he, when he writes back. You remember he's at Athens. He's concerned about it. So he writes this letter back for Timothy to take. <clears throat> and notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And notice in verse 1. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. You remember? So he sends Timothy back. They're at Athens in Greece. We sent Timothy, our beloved brother, God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one may be disturbed by these afflictions. For you know yourselves that we have been destined for this. How many of you like that? You're destined for what? Trouble. You're destined for trouble. And so I think it's important for us. Why do we always ask why? I don't understand it. You're told you're going to have. It. Notice what he also says in the next reason, and when he goes on a little bit further. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. So it came to pass, as you know. If he's only with them a short period of time, notice one of the first things he's telling them is what? Why is it that I hear so often from people, just try Christianity. If you don't like it, leave. Everything will be great. You have somebody that walks with you through the trials, yes. But you will have trials. So I think it's important to recognize that we're going to. We're destined to it and you're forewarned about it. Isn't that what James 1 tells you? Consider it all joy, my brethren, if you encounter various trials? No. When? When. Not if. When. Every person is going to have trials. And it will not always make sense. Otherwise it wouldn't be a walk of faith. So stopping just to the fact of life do I recognize that difficulties are part of the Christian life? I think the quicker, quicker we recognize that it, it, it's going to be part of life, just be ready for it and, re, and be following Him with it, and then how do you prepare for it? If you all knew that some financial thing was going to happen a year from now, what would you all do? You think about in Egypt, Joseph said they had how many years of good times? Seven. So what they do? 
story up? They prepared for it. Paul told the Thessalonians, you're going to have trouble. How many of us are storing up and preparing for difficulties that come? And how many of us want Christ and want Scripture to help us through it? Well, if we need to then be storing it up. So first of all, it's the fact of life. First Thessalonians, then look at the choices you have. We all have different choices. In chapter 3, then of 1 Thessalonians, notice in verse 5, it makes this statement. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I so also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor should be in vain. First choice, how many desert? Things happen and they, they desert. Uh, you have desertion for a lot of different things. You have, uh, if you remember, Demas deserted for the, the pleasures of the world. A lot of different desertion. And, uh, you can see it in different ones. Notice also, Thessalonians, let's turn over to 2 Thessalonians for a moment, chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians. One is desertion. Notice the second choice you have. Notice in verse 3 of chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians. For we always give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting or deserving, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you towards one another grows even greater. The second choice you have is development. Trials can bring about development. Unless it says their love is growing and enlarging, and people know about it. And I think it's amazing that their love and their faith is increasing. During difficult times, does our faith increase or does it decrease? And in their case, notice because of the choices that they made, it's increasing. You have this development, but notice you also have display. Notice in verse 4. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all persecutions and afflictions which you endure. How many people saw it? Everybody. And notice Paul and Silas and so on are using the Thessalonians as an example to other people in the region on how to handle persecution. It's coming. And how do you handle it? Look at how they handle it. You have the same thing you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. One of the reasons you and I go through suffering so that we can help others later when they go through suffering. You respect somebody a great deal when they have been through something that you're going through. How do you handle it? It's, it's much harder when you talk to somebody who's never been through difficulties or had life quite easy because they can give you some, uh, you know, some bad answers. It's interesting to display. It's interesting to look at some of those words. Perseverance is patience or endurance in difficult circumstances. Well, the Thessalonians, obviously, they were in difficult circumstances. Endure means to patiently wait. How many of us like to patiently wait? Lord, give me patience and give it to me. Okay? At least for most of us are consistent that way. It's amazing, isn't it? Notice that he says the way to believe is to be fully persuaded. You remember in Romans 4.21, the definition of faith. Abraham was being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. Do we really have faith in the Lord that he sees what we're going through, he's there with us, and he'll see us through? You also notice it said persecution. It's talking about uh, being, it's hostile, but it's, it's the word for being pursued uh, by the outside. So here you have an enemy. It would be like if you're uh, you know, a, a, a rabbit or whatever, and you're being pursued by a coyote or whatever. That coyote's going to keep coming. How long? Until he gets his prey. He's going to keep coming. And the enemy is the same way. The enemy is not going to chase you for a half a block and say, I'm tired, I'm quitting. They're going to keep coming. It's also interesting, the word there for affliction means to be squeezed. Squeezed from without. This incredible pressure from all different sides. And Satan is going to do it. Notice Paul, it's what's interesting. Paul, you're young believers. You don't know your Bible, but I'm so proud that you have not given in to all these things. In fact, you are increasing in your faith and in your love. It's amazing when they do that. So I want you to think about it. You look at the uh, part of it, you have it. 
I think it's interesting too, notice when you get to verse 5, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgments that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. So notice when you look at it, it demonstrates the worthiness. How many of us think demonstrates my worthiness? How many of us want to have it be shown in the future this is going to happen, but you're demonstrating the faithfulness that you have today. People can see that. And notice I think it's interesting what he has, the delineation, or notice from verse 6 down to verse 10, it's interesting what you have there. Notice what does he say. I think it's interesting. Let's look at verse 6. For After all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction to those who are afflicted. How many of us like to let those who are punishing us turn it over to God? When is he going to do it? It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be eternity. But how many of us want to wait for Him to take care of it? Vengeance is what? Thus says, okay, it's important. Because I think a lot of times we want to put our name in. He promises to take care of Him, and He's promised to punish. But notice, if we allow the Lord to take care of it, we stay true. Notice what happens in verse 11. I think it's interesting what you have to this end also we pray for you always that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power in order that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ it's amazing you're going through this great persecution don't give in to let God take care of it persevere and notice you are going to be considered worthy and it's going to be basically credited to your account. God recognizes it. And so I think, but again, do we have a choice? We can desert. We can develop. We can display it. Why is it that people go to hear Johnny Erickson speak? Why? She goes all over the U.S. and been all over the U.S. Why do people go hear her speak? <coughs> Because she's been through tremendous, obviously, the accident and tremendous pain, and she could praise the Lord and do a lot of things. And so people go to hear. Do you think she wished it didn't happen or that she could be cured? God had. God's using her through these difficult times. A lot of times, God takes, allows us to go through things in order to help somebody else who's going through a difficult thing. But against our choice, we can desert, we can develop, we can, uh, you know, you think about it, we can display it. Isn't that what we're supposed to do with our life? We can display it or we can hide it. Again, it's up to us. So what do you, uh, what difficult circumstance are you in? We, Jen and I last night were there and we saw different students. We saw Tina Lowball. Uh, you all might remember she's the one that was at the hospital. Uh, all of a sudden just about died. Uh, basically had to resuscitate her four times. Lost her sight, lost all kinds of things. Hadn't been married all that long. She was just single many years. She wanted to come last night. The Lord is really, you know, restoring her health slowly. Two months after she had that, her Steve and her brother uh, also just about died. So, you know, they've been through a lot. But they were believers serving the Lord. But then you had others that were there, and it was real obvious. Either they, uh, they hadn't served the Lord and uh, their life uh, Gene and I were commenting a lot of them looked like they were our teachers and not the other way around <laughs> they, they, they had kind of a rough life in some of them. Uh, but again it's our choices it's our choices and so what, how trials are coming for every one of us what are we going to do desert are we going to let it develop us and we then are going to let it display and help others as they go through it the third thing I think, what do we need to focus on when we're going through trials? Because are they coming? So what we need to focus on. Look over to First Peter. Remember, First Peter likewise was written to those believers who are under trials. First Peter chapter one. So we have the uh, 
Trials are a, difficulties are a fact of life. Two, we have choices to make when we're in it. And three, notice our focus. Starting in chapter three of First Peter, notice what it says: "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to His great mercy, notice what He's done for us, has caused us to be born again to a living hope." To the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So what's the first thing you have? A living hope, being born again. Notice the second thing. To obtain an inheritance, notice your inheritance, which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. Notice the third thing. Who are protected? It's the word for garrison. Who's protecting it? God is. By the power of God, through faith and salvation, ready to reveal in the last time. First thing, how many of us, when we're going through hard times, look at what we have? You look at what we have. Do we have salvation in Jesus Christ? Do we have an inheritance in heaven? We're going to be a son of God, living in eternity, all the other things. And that's part of why Paul calls it in 2 Corinthians, light affliction. Temporary. Hey, and he had the afflictions. Paul had it from the time he came to know Christ until his death. He had an affliction after affliction after affliction. A great deal. But he looked at it. Why did, first in Hebrews 11, 25, why did Moses put up with afflictions and give up the wealth of Egypt? Because he was looking for his eternal possessions. So notice first one, is this our possessions? Notice in verse 6. Now in possessions, in this you greatly rejoice, obviously talking about verse 3 to 5, even though now for a little while it is, if necessary, you'll be distressed by various trials. Notice it says for a little while. The trials are passing. It may be a day. It may be five years. It could be 60 years. But they're passing. Eternity is a long time. And so we think about it, the trials are passing, keeping our eyes on the finish line. So notice how he is in possessions and passing. Notice also in verse 7, what about proof? That the proof of your faith, one reason you go through trials is to prove what? Who you are. Notice it says, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found result in the praise and glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our focus should be on the end, and it's showing who we are, it's purifying us, and we're going to be rewarded, and it's showing to everybody else what we have. And it's amazing. We want people to come up to us then and ask us, what do you have? I want it. How did you go through this? How do you do this? I want it. And so I think it's important to look at it you have the praise. They're living for obviously for the uh, line not to die. And then notice what about the uh, the other thing that you're focusing on in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Remember, it says fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You think about it when Peter was walking on water. Jesus said to come to him. Did he walk on water? Yes, for a while. When did he start to sink? took his eye off Jesus. The same is true for us. We have to keep our eyes on Christ or it'll do fine. Just the lighthouse or anything, you've got to keep our eyes on Him. The same thing happened in John 21. You remember he, Jesus told Peter he's going to suffer a death he didn't want, which he did, crucifixion. And his next question was what? What about John? His eyes were on what? How many times do we look around and at other people and what they're doing instead of looking at Christ? I think it's important when we look at it, the person. So you think about it. What are you focusing on during difficult times? Most of you say Most of the time we're in a difficult time, we focus on what? The problem. But we need to be looking at the other. You think about this one. How often do we think about what we have? If you haven't read the book, it's a little bitty book. I challenge you to get it. 
It's called the 4-8 principle. Coming from what? Philippians 4 and verse 8. What does that say? Well, the guys are looking blank. Let's turn over to it. This is bonus. This wasn't in target. Philippians 4 and verse 8. And where is Paul when he writes this? He's in prison and he's in this, this pristine prison. Notice what he says. From 6 and 7, you know well, I'll talk about be anxious for nothing. But notice in verse 8. Finally, brethren, and it's plural here, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is a good report, if there's anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, let your mind what? Dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. Most of the time, our mind is dwelling where? And in the book, it's interesting if you get a chance to read it. The authors who had all these different things to do, and his son was playing baseball like seventh grade, breaks his arm, and now he's, his season's over, and he's all down. And so the dad makes him get paper out and every day, write 10 things or 20 things you're thankful for. And every day he starts to go down, he has to go to his room and write 20 things he's thankful for, trying to change the mindset of what am I thankful for? Dwell on that. Don't dwell on the fact your baseball season's over. You'll have another season. You'll have other things. And so I think it's important for all of us. We usually dwell on what I lost, and we don't think about what we have. So think about it then. We look at this, the difficulties of life that we're facing. Is it a fact of life? We are going to have difficulties. But, we have somebody there to help us in those difficulties. So you think about it, it's a fact of life. The choice is obviously then, am I going to allow it to develop me? Am I going to display Christ in it? Why did the Philippian joy, you know, jailer come to Christ, uh, to uh, Paul and say, what must I do to be saved? Because of how Paul and Silas handled the trial. Had they handled it the way most of us would have happened, what would, you know, or, or do, what would they do? The Philippian jailer probably would have killed him. He wouldn't have come up to him. And then obviously the last one, the focus during the trial, look at what we have. Look at the fact that, hey, it won't be here always. And hey, it's proving who I am to everyone and to Christ, and I will get a reward one day in the future. So think about that.